The action of the book of Esther takes place a long time ago in an empire far, far away, so it'd be good just to get acquainted with it before we get started. So I'd like to ima- you to imagine yourself floating high in the brilliant blue sky of the Middle East. The air is cool up at this altitude, but you can see the shimmer of heat on the ground far below. You're looking straight down and you can see the citadel of Susa, the royal city of the Persian Empire. It's 479 BC and it's late afternoon. You're 300 kilometres north of the Persian Gulf over modern day Iran. From up here you can see the curvature of the earth and the distant borders of the Persian Empire. As you're floating up there you look east and you can see right on the horizon the great Indus River in Pakistan. Turn around to the west, you can see the glittering Mediterranean and even to the very shores of Greece. Look to your left, the mighty Nile Delta, and your eyes follow that ribbon of river until it disappears in the distant heat haze. That's as far as this empire stretches. Pakistan to Greece to Ethiopia and everywhere in between. The Bible says there are 127 provinces, the great empire of its day. Now you can feel yourself beginning to drop and the air heats up until it's almost unbearable and then rapidly cools as you descend into this walled garden that's described for us here in chapter 1. Gliding down past blue and white linen sails that roll in the afternoon breeze, your bare feet touch down on the cool marble inlaid with precious stones. The smell of spices and exotic meats fill your senses And you see many men uh, reclined on gold and silver couches, all drinking from gold goblets, no two of them alike. You've arrived at the end of a banquet that has lasted 187 days, a full six months. For 180 days, the king has entertained all his regional leaders, preparing them for the next move to extend his empire even further over into Greece. And the last seven days, you've seen a party for the citizens of Susa itself, from the least to the greatest, all enjoying the king's wealth and liberality. What a king, what power, what greatness, what wealth. But where is he in all of this? Who is this great man? Well, in the far corner of his empire, he wrote an inscription that archaeologists have found today. And on that inscription, he describes himself as the great king, the king of kings, the king of lands occupied by many races, the king of this great world. Humble man, but uh, given the job of being the emperor of the Persians. And your eyes look at who could this be? And you see there on a dice the king himself, Xerxes. Historians record him as taller, more handsome and more ruthless than any other Persian king. Dark curly hair, a long well-groomed beard, ruler of an empire unequaled on the earth at the time. As we've dropped into this party in chapter 1, we see him in close consultation with his trusted advisers. What could he be talking about? The next military conquest? Trade issues across the vast empire? Magnificent building works? Well, in fact, a crisis has gripped the palace. Something has happened that threatens to ruin this six-month-long party, threatens even this vast empire itself. And so far, the story is exotic to us. It's far away in place and time. It's a story of celebrity and the lifestyles of the rich and famous. Yet we're about to enter very familiar territory. What happens in this chapter doesn't necessarily sound modern. It sounds timeless. From the Persian Empire to the Academy Awards and its after parties to US presidential inaugural balls to elite sports in Australia, we've heard this story before and many of us today here have lived it. So what is that issue? Well, it centres around Queen Vashti, whom we meet in verse 9. Now, the book's called Esther, but we don't even hear about Esther until chapter 2. The narrator could have started his story at chapter 2 and and made a brief mention of Vashti, if at all. She's not critical to the story, but she gets a whole chapter around her. 
Vashti's story is important. Her experience will help us understand the danger that Esther's about to be in. But also, in God's plan, Vashti's story needs to be told. She's a minor character in the story, she's a minor character in the Bible, but in God's planning, her story matters. And I want to think today about why that is. Well, we see the two different um, banquets. Apparently, in Persian culture of that time, the wives of the male guests were unable to attend for a short time and then were expected to leave while the men got on with things that they didn't want their wives to see. So in verse 9, Vashti holds a separate banquet for the women of the palace while the men carry on and get carried away elsewhere in the palace. Vashti's not her real name. It's a pet name given to her by the king. It means desired or best or beautiful one. So instead of calling her by her own name, he uses a name which describes her in relation to him. He desires her. He considers her the best of his many women in the harem. She's beautiful. And it's her beauty that he wants to show off. In verses 10 and 11, the king, in high spirits from wine, and we'll see that quite often throughout this book of uh, people in power, uh, drunk on uh, alcohol, commanded that she be brought before him and his guests. The reasons given there, in order to display her beauty to the people. Verse 4 tells us that for 180 days, Xerxes has been displaying his vast wealth and his glory. And in the days before fireworks on New Year's Eve, the dramatic finale of this extended drinking binge will be the appearance of the stunningly beautiful queen. She is the piece de resistance of all his possessions. And I use possession deliberately. He has in his possession a most beautiful woman and he wants to display her as a reflection of his greatness and power. So in verse 11, the command is for her to come and to appear in her royal crown. I remember my college lecturer saying that it's implied that that is all she is to be wearing, just the crown. She's to be paraded before a group of men who have been on a six-month alcoholic bender, like at some end-of-year footy tour to Bali or a debauched 21st birthday. Remember reading uh, Indigenous leader Warren Mundine's autobiography recently, and his first job was at Bankstown Sports Club in the 70s down in Sydney. He said one night the room was booked out by a citywide car dealership for their end-of-year awards night. All the salesmen were there and no wives or girlfriends were in attendance, a bit like this. They brought in their own waitresses for that meal who served tables in their high heels, only their high heels. Warren, as a young man, was just appalled by what was going on. But we see a different scale but the same attitude as Xerxes. His exploitation and objectification of Vashti is echoed and repeated wherever money and power and men seem to intersect. In verse 12, we learn that for some reason not given to us, Vashti refuses. Maybe she knows what's been going on. Maybe she has too much dignity to parade herself before a bunch of drunken louts, no matter how important they are. And when Vashti bravely refuses to come, like a spoiled brat, Xerxes gets the sulks. Immediately, in the very same verse as her refusal, verse 12, he's furious and burns with anger. We see that he only wants two qualities in the women around him. He wants beauty and compliance. They were to be objects that please him and do what he says. And he can't stand the fact that she's her own person and refuses to come. He's not alone in that. Because Vashti's self-composed response brings panic to all the king's trusted advisors. Half the chapter's taken up with, what do we do now? How can the, how can the empire survive this? We see in verse 13 that the king was so often in high spirits that he needed men around him who understood the times. Men who knew the weighty matters of Persian law and could make wise decisions for him. The trouble is, they're no different to him. To them, Vashti's defiance threatens the very stability of an empire that extends from Pakistan to Ethiopia. 
In verses 16 to 18, they're afraid that Vashti will spark a revolution and the men will lose control. The wives who have been excluded from the nobles' debauchery might actually push back against their husbands. And to them, it's the end of the world as they know it. What are we going to do? Verse 18, where we finish the reading, that noble said, there will be no end of disrespect and discord. Shame about the disrespect they've shown to their wives so far. But they are in a panic. What are they going to do? How are they going to get out of this? How can they reassert their authority? How do the men stand up to this rebellion and show once for all who's in charge? And so they, after all their deliberation, set down a law that cannot be repealed, decreeing that Vashti can never enter the king's presence again. They punish her for not coming into the king's presence by not letting her come into the king's presence. It's, it's brilliant, isn't it? It's very clever, aren't they? I bet they all sighed with relief after that. Well, <laughs> we averted a disaster there, didn't we? The empire's safe now. We can go back to drinking. And people have mentioned over the years the fragile male ego. Well, here it is in all its fragility and ugliness. Women are to be valued only for their beauty and compliance and the men will get that compliance, even if it's by the point of a sword. So the scene is set for the rest of the book. What we'll see is that the women in Esther are eminently sensible, independent, and brave. And the men, with one exception, are hopeless, self-serving drunkards. Well, I wonder where the book's going to go then, with that uh, set up. The writer of Esther is doing a few things with this chapter. And first of all, it serves as a warning. Because in Xerxes' character, we see danger. He's a man given to drunkenness, of volatile emotions, and yet he holds absolute power. He can make rules that will never be repealed, but he lacks all ability to use that power wisely. His wealth and empire were earned by his father and grandfather, Darius and Cyrus, whom Daniel served, one of the wisest men who ever lived. <laughs> Xerxes has inherited both great wealth and power, but he doesn't know how to use them. So not only will he suffer personally from that, and we'll see that in the next chapter, but the whole Jewish nation throughout his empire are threatened by this man of uh, volatile emotions and absolute power. But that's for later. When we're introduced to Esther, next chapter, and she's sucked into this vortex of the royal court, we now understand the danger that she'll be in. Esther is not a love story about how the powerful king falls for the beautiful peasant girl because he sees the world only in terms of himself, obsessed with his power, and all he wants from women is beauty and compliance. And his fury erupts when compliance is not given. So how is that going to work out for Esther? There may come a time, as the book unfolds, where she needs to stand up to that king, or maybe to defy one of those royal decrees that cannot be repealed. So we'll have to wait and see how that works out. But I also said earlier that Vashti's story stands on its own. She's not here only to sort of pave the way for Esther, she gets a whole chapter, and I think that's significant. We have to think about why that is. Why does her story get to be told as well? We, aren't, we don't find out what happens to her after this. She never is to enter the king's presence again. For all intents and purposes, she disappears. You know, her brave stand is punished rather than rewarded. She features no more in the records of the Persian Empire. But here in God's story, she remains. She features here. We hear her story and it's not forgotten. So is she part of a bigger story? Well, one standout in the book of Esther is that God isn't mentioned at all. It's very similar to the book of Ruth. We don't hear of God doing things in the book of Ruth, but we hear him spoken about by the people in, in Ruth. But here in Esther, his name's not mentioned at all. So there's a similarity between here and the book of Ruth. Ruth takes place in the time of the judges and we know famously that there, at that time God's people were far away from God and everyone was doing as they saw fit. 
And that was awful for everyone, but especially for women. When we looked at Judges some years ago, that horrible chapter 19 shows what happens when God is ignored. And then when we looked at Ruth, we saw how vulnerable Ruth and Naomi were. You know, we've seen in this chapter what happens when money, power and men interact. Well, we see in Ruth the danger for Naomi Ruth when poverty, powerlessness and women intersect. The books of Judges and Ruth and Esther fit Solomon's description in Ecclesiastes of life under the sun. That's a description of life when we conduct ourselves as though God doesn't exist where this world is all that there is, there's no upward look to anything higher or greater than us, that we are the bosses of our lives and we do as we see fit. And when that is the characteristic of life, then exploitation and wielding of power is the order of the day. In terms of the relationship between the sexes, it's as God describes back in Genesis 3. When our vertical relationship with God is broken because of sin, our horizontal relationships with people are also broken. You see that with Adam and Eve, blame being thrown everywhere and no responsibility being taken. And the way people relate to one another is through domination. God said to Eve, your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. And that brokenness is on stark display here in Esther chapter 1. The men are trying to rule over, dominate the women and force their compliance. Vashti, Vashti bravely defies that and she's banished. The men enact a new rule to further dominate and crush any resistance. So is that all there is? is we, are we seeing in Vashti just what life is under the sun? Not even a queen, the most powerful woman in the empire, could resist it or escape it. Is there any hope for those waitresses back at Bankstown Sports Club? Harvey Weinstein has been accused of sexual assaults on women as he preyed on them through his work as a movie producer. What did he demand from those women? Beauty and compliance. He demanded that they did what he wanted and took it from them when they refused and then demanded silence of them. Donald Trump boasted about his access to women and what did he demand? Beauty and compliance. In chapter 2, Xerxes will demand an, an empire-wide beauty contest. Donald Trump bought a beauty contest. Even Solomon, one of the great kings of Israel, ran a harem, and for all the romance of the Song of Songs, he had 700 wives and 300 concubines. Most of them married to him just to cement a deal with a foreign king. Beauty and compliance, exploitation and abuse. And in many uh, abusive relationships today, those demands are still being made. Sometimes a man will determine what his wife or girlfriend can and can't wear. Or he'll limit her access to social media or her phone. He'll limit her friendships or her work or her money. And like Xerxes, he'll be furious and burn with anger if she tries to be her own person rather than his exclusive property. The research of Julia Baird has identified that these kinds of abuses also happen even within Christian marriages and within ministry couples. Life under the sun has penetrated the church as well. It's a bleak picture. Can anything be done about that? Is that the way things will always be? It was true in 479 BC. It was true in the 1970s in Australia. It's true today. Was Vashti's noble resistance futile? Well, life under the sun, life lived without God, is bleak and awful. The intersection of men and power has always led to Genesis 3 ways of living. Yet, in the goodness of God, that's not the end of the story. In Jesus, God breaks into life under the sun. And so we see in Jesus a man with absolute power. So how do we see him use his power, particularly as he relates to women? Well, in John 8, we see him deal very graciously with a, man, with a woman caught in adultery. The Pharisees had uh, caught her. They would conveniently let the man go, but they wanted her stoned to death. Jesus honoured Mary's decision to learn from him, even though that was meant to be only a male occupation at the time, and even though Martha, her sister, complained about it. His parables feature women as models of faith. 
He gave Mary Magdalene the joyful privilege of being the first witness of his resurrection and gave her the commission of being an apostle to the apostles and proclaimed to them the resurrection. He said he came not to lord it over people, not to be served, like Xerxes demanded, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. In Jesus, we see Genesis 3 overcome and overturned. His death and resurrection gives hope for men and women. He's reconciled our vertical relationship with God, and through that, he reconciles our horizontal relationships with one another. We read Vashti's story and our hearts ache for a better way. She reminds us of so many other examples and maybe even ourselves. And we see the danger and that so many who have come after her are in. But in conquering sin and death, Jesus has set the captives free. He sets us free to no longer have to live as though we are under the sun. And so if you are in a relationship and you do demand compliance, what we're seeing here is that you are not living as a Christian, but in opposition to Jesus. But to demand compliance from someone else is completely at odds with Jesus' character and his commands to us. If you're in a relationship where your compliance is demanded, well, then that other person is not acting as a Christian or a follower of Jesus. And you do not have to endure that. You can find someone who you can trust to talk to about that and we will support you as a church. In Jesus, the new creation is broken in. Vashti's story is not the end of the story. Jesus calls us to live in this new life. As Greg started off the service with Psalm 34, it speaks about how God turns his face against those who do evil, but also turns his face toward those who are brokenhearted and lifts up those who are downcast. Let's come before God in prayer and bring these things to him. Father, just one chapter, and it exposes so much of what we see throughout history, in our own society, maybe even in our own lives. And Father, our hearts ache, and we know that your heart aches. You draw near to those who are brokenhearted and downcast. You see the injustices and the abuse, and we thank you that because of what Jesus has done, that life under the sun isn't all it's going to be. But instead, he's ushered in the new creation. Where he's brought freedom for those who are captive in these kinds of situations. And Father, he's able to release hearts that are set in trying to just manipulate everyone else to their own needs. Father, we're deeply in need of your mercy and grace. And we thank you that in Jesus we have that in abundance. Lord, we pray that as we seek to relate to one another, both in our own intimate relationships, in our families, amongst our friends and here at church, that we wouldn't be like those who live under the sun as though uh, we have no accountability, but instead that we might be uh, transformed by the Lord Jesus, by your Holy Spirit living within us, and that we might have that joy of not only being reconciled to you, but being reconciled to each other. That we truly follow the Lord Jesus, who came not to be served, but to serve. Lord, may that characterise our relationships as well. For we ask it in his name. Amen.